Hello and welcome to Dateline London, the state we're in. Is there a vacuum at the heart of British politics? How far does the future of the European Union rest on the next president of France and the fight against the group calling itself Islamic State? Who will actually be doing the fighting? My guests today are Agnès Poirier, who is UK editor of France's Marianne, Stryker Maguire of Bloomberg Markets, Mina al oraibi who's an Arab affairs commentator, and Ned Temko, the author and journalist. Very good to see you. Well, the tradition in Britain is for opposition parties to do well in by-elections since they can often be used as a protest vote against the sitting government. This week, the Conservatives actually won a seat in Copeland held by Labour for several generations. And UKIP's leader lost in the seat his party claimed was Britain's Brexit capital, Stoke. As we move towards Brexit, we clearly have a government. Do we have anything which looks like an opposition? Perhaps the Scottish National Party, Nathan. That's about it. And possibly the unelected House of Lords in, House its, of Lords. in its way. But the short answer, do we have a opposition in the House of Commons, in the elected chamber? No, absolutely not. You have, uh, and you mentioned by-elections. Opposition parties actually have to work really hard to lose a by-election against a sitting government. And the last time, it happened once in the early 1980s, but that was a special circumstance because labor was splitting at the time. The last time it went so far to the left that it became kind of serially unelectable. But the, the last real loss by an opposition party was in the 1960s. And the last time labor lost that particular seat was in the 1930s. So, so it's a huge deal. Uh, and it's hard to see how Corbyn, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labor Party leader, can recover not so much just from the by-election, but from the fact that clearly the opinion polls, the by-elections, everything shows that a critical mass of even Labor voters don't see him as prime ministerial. And I, that's difficult yeah. to... But, but yet, the, 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 the reaction has been, you know, we're sorry we lost in the seat, but it could have been worse, and uh, steady as you go, it's all <laughs> yeah, fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting is, you know, you ask if the government has an opposition. Labour has its own opposition. I mean, the reason we had these by-elections is because you had two front benchers resigning and then have it calling a by-election. So it's quite interesting because we're seeing this very serious opposition to Corbyn, and yet there is real denial amongst those who support him and say, no, he can carry on. What's also interesting is, of course, we have now the Lib Dems and UKIP vying for who is the third party mm -hmm. here. And still, third parties in the UK don't impact the big picture politics. But we're seeing this competition between those two who get a smaller size of the electorate, but they're the ones who are clearly defined. We know what UKIP stands for. We know what the Liberal Democrats stand for. And interestingly, both are very much... Uh, focused on Brexit and, and the EU. One and completely immigrants. for it and one completely against it. Absolutely. And very clear in both, both cases. Absolutely. Whereas for the Conservatives and Labour, and this is why it was so interesting to see the by-election that the Conservatives were able to win in a constituency that has been Labour for 80-odd years, because people felt like, oh, this MP could actually look out for us in an area that ordinarily would think Labour looks out for them. So what is the defining features of both parties? It's hard to see at the moment. You know, on the, on the UKIP and the Lib Dems, obviously ideologically completely opposed to one another, but um, there's also another difference. Is with The Lib Dems are gaining support. Certainly, uh, you just anecdotally, you hear it a lot because of, largely because of what's going on in Labour. UKIP is in very serious mm. trouble. I mean, really serious trouble. Well, their, their leader, Paul Nuttall, fought what was a pretty disastrous campaign yes. in a seat that he clearly thought he should win and uh, party workers thought they should win because they put in a lot of effort. But the campaign was shambolic. Oh, it was, uh, I mean, it must have been, it must have been just cringe-making to have been around him when all this was, when all this was going on. It was absolutely appalling. Well, he's another leader who, um, presumably, he will survive just because they've had such trouble finding a successor to Nigel Farage. Maybe he right. and Corbyn could swap. <laughs> <laughs> Try it out. Well, where, 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 where do you see this? Because, I mean, you could say, actually, the Conservatives have their own opposition. It's within their own ranks, too, uh, although it's a much quieter True. and more subtle opposition yeah. than it is, has been in Labour. Well, as we say in French, Theresa May has a boulevard in front of her, no position. Mm -hmm. And she can now, it's extraordinary when you listen to her, uh, she's the workers' party, apparently. She represents, <laughs> uh, OK. That's one of the great. newspapers this weekend said, and, we are the party of the but, workers. But you tend to believe her, and actually Copeland, 
um, does uh, do her credits on, on that level. Well, it's except true. it was the nuclear industry that did her credits. Yes, yeah. that, that's correct. But that remapping of democracy is also happening in France mm. because there's no opposition anymore. I mean, the, the, the French left is in disarray in the same way um, as it is here in the UK. And Not to mention the American left. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're, I mean, some things must, um, something has to give. That is to say, uh, the rise of a centrist party, the split of mm. uh, Labour and the Socialist mm. Party in France. Something is going to happen well, like, because it, it c cannot the, go like this. It's not the key issue, though, because the reason she has a boulevard now <laughs> is she can go on sometimes inanely saying Brexit means Brexit mm. because Brexit hasn't happened yet. And the real, the other shoe that has yet to drop is what happens when Article 50 is triggered, when some of the real-life effects of Brexit begin to take hold. And that's when, particularly inside the Tory party, it'll be worth watching. But you need, you, sorry, sorry, I was I gonna say, you need somebody to take advantage of that, don't you? Yeah, and Labour does will. not look like the and party will, at the she, moment. But she may actually now start considering an early election, well, because you're right. Say, yeah. The momentum yeah. um, at, that she has at the moment, she won't keep once Article 50 mm. is triggered, we assume. So then is it now the time to consider calling an early election at, at the moment that Labour is in when such you think, I mean, how, when could you ever say that, 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 a, that a conservative prime Minister's popularity grows the further north you go until you reach Scotland. Until you reach Scotland, that's a different case. But, but that, that is remarkable. And Copeland is, you know, yeah. the, the north, Labour Absolutely. in the north has been. Mm. But, but do, you think, do you think into this vacuum that you're talking about, uh, uh, Tony Blair? could come back, David Miliband mm -hmm. could come back well, for Labour, I mean... good question, <laughs> because, of course, I mean, Tony Blair is the man that the British love to hate, but he was the only sensical voice, you know, a week ago when he talked about Europe. And you think... Not everybody thinks guy. that, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Even people who hate him thought, I actually agree with everyone. He was clear. He, he was, was clear. clear. That was one of the difference. Whether you, you agree with him or not. And he did make the broader argument, I know we're coming back to Europe, that it isn't just about Brexit. In other words, we see Trump, we see Brexit. There is a need, yes. Tony Blair was arguing, for a reconstitution of a sane centre-left, centre-right coalition yeah. that will sort of steer... But do a reasonable you, path. Do, do you see but it's it? not him coming back. No, but, no. but do you no, see, no, da no. Do you no. see da for example, David Miliband, oh, do you see, yeah. uh, uh, you know, see somebody that. who's been in British politics, yeah. uh, but, was, but he was yeah. back from New York. associated with or tarnished by the wrong. Blair years. Mm. That's, you know, that's the challenge. And we yeah. know about the stories about his brother and all that. But, but he was part of the Blair thing. It's there, that, which, and that's never going to go away, but it will, the memories will become a little it fuzzier. It will become an asset at some point, I'm sure it, of that. If Brexit, ah. well, especially if Brexit, <laughs> if Brexit and he was an in the wrong way. he was an independent member, a relatively independent member of New Labour in the sense that he started as a policy advisor in number 10, and he always had a, a mind of his own. The and question is, does he have the real ambition that's required because at key junctures during the mess that was Tony Blair versus Gordon Brown uh, there was a real opportunity and even an expectation among some on the Blair side of the party yeah. that David Miliband right. would step forward and mm. seize the crown and he always didn't quite want to I do it. I think he has a certain yeah. sense of decency, actually. That oh, that'll never he's work not enough. Cutthroat. <laughs> yeah. well, he's not cutthroat <laughs> enough to do it. And, you know, the way he, he really extracted himself with that whole rivalry with his brother and so forth. Mm. But, you know, there's a reason he's never ruled it out. And I think he does consider it. He does, uh, considers it often. I um, spoke with him a few months ago now, just briefly, and said, you know, aren't you going to come back? And he said, well, you know, the time's not really right, but you know, ah. you yeah, never know. So, even, so it's clear. Even yesterday, you know, yeah. you know he, he said, he said never he's, he's, yeah. he's, he's quite, never he's quite yeah. open yeah. about it. But the thing is, to your point, Ned, is that several times he's had an opportunity to like go for it, yeah, uh, and he hasn't. So, so the question is, does he has he acquired the sort of backbone that you need to really push it to the next level. Especially since the party is in much worse shape mm. than when he ran for the leadership Absolutely. before. Yeah. It is isn't much. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Because since uh, France and Germany have together been the motors of the European Union, elections in both countries this year will define the future of the EU at its most difficult period, with Britain obviously determined to leave. If in France Marine Le Pen wins, is the Euro and possibly even the EU finished. I mean, let's, let's do the if first, and we can do the caveats. If she wins, she will have a vote on the euro. 
She's Winnetra. not going to win. Right, I, 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 was <laughs> <beyond> <laughs> I was trying to get beyond that. I was trying to get beyond that. Okay, she's not going to win. I but... might have to eat my words, eat my hat live on that yeah. uh, in that studio in, in, in May. But we've got two rounds. Okay, that's the big difference with the Brexit vote and the Trump vote. So she's going to come first at the first round, and then she will most probably going to lose at the second round, opposite Macron or opposite Fillon. Um, you know, I mean, she, okay, she has the slightest chance of becoming the next uh, president of France if the turnout is really low, which would be historical. Because, because her it's people will turn high. out. If, if it's Fillon against uh, Le Pen, Fillon being so damaged and, you know, uh, just uh, very recently and um, is a the judicial inquiry is inquiry being open. We... And people don't bother to go and vote. She has. But Some I, chances well, can I, just, I wonder whether one, I know we're not allowed to mention, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The president yeah. of the United States. Ah, I think ah, it's on ah, your ah, mind. Yeah. Yeah. We, took a, we took a vow not to mention. <laughs> uh, but I wonder whether the you-know-who effect yeah. uh, will galvanize French voters to realize, you know, do we want that? or the equivalent? And whether turnout will in but, fact be larger? But can, can, I, can I suggest Sorry. she's had... Yeah. A, she's had Quite a good week, hasn't she? Yeah. I mean, mm. you know, this headscarf business with the Grand Mufti, uh, you couldn't, go, uh, appealing to the kind of electorate she wishes to appeal to, she couldn't have asked for something better in secular France. Yes, that's correct. But she also has, it's, it's incredible because she has also a lot of financial scandals at her door. Um, and with uh, exactly the same allegations, you know, um, from Brussels, the way she uses uh, her budget to actually um, hire people, and it's been quite dodgy, and, and uh, um, Brussels is, is uh, launching inquiries against her. Uh, what, what, do you, what, what do you make of that? And, and, and she did, I mean, in terms of her electorate, she did a very clever job this week, did she not, in refusing to wear a headscarf? Absolutely. And, you know, you feel sorry for the Lebanese because whoever is president of France, they need to work with. So they had to receive her, although it was very, very complicated for most of the Lebanese um, political factions. But my point is also to think that regardless of what happens in the elections, you know, there's almost this sense that if, OK, if Le Pen doesn't win in France, then the EU is safe has huge problems, yeah. mm. even if she doesn't get elected, which hopefully she won't be, and I'm, I'm banking on your, <laughs> on your analysis, um, the EU is not going to be able to pull out from this. We still have the Greek crisis, economic crisis, that people keep wanting to forget about. We have real troubles in Italy. We don't know what's going to happen um, with a lot of the issues against immigration, because one Germany, of the things that's happening, exactly, yeah, and then, Germany, and and then we come to Germany. Although, of course, the um, the election of the new president gave many people some hope, actually, of the sort of stature, um, having Steinmeier come in as president, and the stature um, of the Germans at the moment is looking good, but we'll have to wait and see. So I think one of the things is how are the leaders of Europe actually working together to face off what Brexit will mean for the union when they're all so busy with their own domestic elections? Well, I think there, that's the big problem. There's, a, there's yet another layer, too, also because there you now have the external factors of what's happening in the United States and what's happening in Russia, which right. are really causing the EU, this, this, the, the, that old spirit that created the yeah. EU in the first place. You know, we, we better be in this together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard, it's really hard to imagine the EU falling apart. Uh, it just, I just, it's not hard to imagine the euro falling apart, is well, it? Well, exactly. So to yeah. go back yeah. to your question, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So but let's imagine. <laughs> let's Le Pen, imagine. Let's yeah. imagine Le Pen uh, is uh, becoming France's next president. You promise. She's very yes, but it's a if. Um, she is very astute because she's not going to hold a referendum about belonging to the European Union because the French feel too much European mm. to actually um, vote for to go for that. But. What she will do is a referendum on the euro, and she's likely to win it. Because it's very unpopular in yeah, France. Yeah, it is unpopular, or unpopular enough to actually tilt it to 51%. Do you know if there were, if there were referendums... And that would be the end. If that there were referendums the on the euro in a number of euro mm. countries, yeah. Uh, Greece being an obvious yeah. uh, possible example. Germany even, uh, who knows? Yeah. I mean, but they're they, really false. It, it's, a, it, it's a kind of false referendum. It's a sort of Brexit referendum in the sense that if you have widespread discontent, if in fact people th can think they can blame economic malaise on the mm. euro and that's going to fix it, then of course they're going to they're vote against it. But in fact, that's not going to fix it. Yeah. 
course. Well, then yeah. you have to actually have politicians that are brave enough to say that. Yeah. And that's very rare at the moment. Yeah. Where, where, where do you think this leaves Britain? Because you could, you could say that in voting for Brexit, the British have decided that they will at some point, whatever the difficulties ahead, leave a union which is failing and which many of the people, the ordinary citizens, know is failing, even mm. in countries that have been very strongly in favour of the EU. Well, I th I, it's such a complicated question because to the extent the EU does fail, and, and I agree with Stryker, I think one of the ironies is there, there, there are now forces that are bringing it in many ways closer together again. Uh, one of the reasons will be Brexit. In other words, the, this big building block that is British membership, they're just going to yank out. And that's an obvious challenge to the EU as an organization. So in a way, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The irony th that I still can't get over is that even though the Remain campaign was lousy at getting this point across, Britain, of all the EU member states, had a charmed existence. It wasn't a member of the euro. It opted out of everything it didn't like. It had a very beneficial trading relationship with this bloc. And I know it's no, you know, r real you know, encouragement to those who think Brexit is a mistake, but it's easy to see a scenario where both sides suffer equally from what happens next. Mm. Let's move on, because after past humiliations at the hands of the group called Islamic State, Iraqi government forces have begun to reverse the tide in Mosul and elsewhere, while in Syria, IS is squeezed between government forces and Kurdish militias. How much support should the United States, Britain and others give, and to whom? I mean, who's doing the, who's doing the fighting? In Iraq, the Iraqi army has been retrained and seems to you know, have a new spirit. Well, it's also important to remember that when Mosul fell to ISIS, it was because the army generals were given the order to withdraw. So, you know, there's, I think, this, this now myth that the army was in complete disarray, they've retrained them, two and a half, later, uh, two and a half years later they've come back. Well, actually, yes, there has been training, there has been a lot of effort, but at the heart of it is the political decision. And the political decision to leave Mosul, Iraq's second city, to ISIS, broke something very significant in Iraq. One of the losses in Mosul, and of course there's huge humanitarian suffering, but also the mosaic that was Mosul in terms of all the different ethnicities and religions and that, who did live together, had some problems, but lived together well. At the moment, that is going to need to be reconstructed. And the army, being the Iraqi army, going back, is, is a hope. And that is an opportunity to try to rebuild that and having belief in the Iraqi state. Having said that, on their heels are uh, some of the popular mobilization units, which are the volunteer force that were put together to fight ISIS, who are in large part sectarian, but not all of them. There are those who are not sectarian. How Iraq is going to figure out dealing with all these armed groups once ISIS is defeated, hugely significant. Because if we end up having groups who are armed, who are just fighting forces, who some want to turn into political parties, like we have Hezbollah in Lebanon with Iranian backing. That could really spell a disastrous period for Iraq going forward. So that's one issue. Then you have, of course, the coalition, which is led by the United States with support from Britain, with support from some Arab countries. That's significant because then we have to say ideologically fighting ISIS. However, you have Iran on the other hand saying, oh, we're part of this coalition, whereas in reality they're supporting some of the most sectarian elements that lead to this complication. Mm -hmm. I know it's a lot of issues to be raised in just 10 minutes, <laughs> but I think the point I'm trying to make is that let's not take it so clear as it's ISIS is bad, everybody else is good, we defeat ISIS, wow. it's all rosy. And unfortunately there are those in power in Washington and other places who think that it could be pushed off that much. However, the military elements that are part of the Trump administration are well aware of this. And if there is any um, Including the voice new national of security reason, advisor, exactly. who's very smart. Very smart and know Iraq inherently well. So that's something to see. Syria is a whole different ballgame. The fact that Iraq, for the first time ever, has used its air force to strike inside of Syria is a huge development. Baghdad, it Moscow, Tehran, Damascus, together came and agreed on that strike. The, I mean, the, the complications... I agree with her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I know you do. I'll get you to explain the middle bit in a minute. No, uh, but but the, the, the point for those of us outside yeah. is, however it's dressed up by some political leaders on different sides of the Atlantic, there are no good guys and bad guys who are absolutely definitive and... and well, in particular in is, Syria, is what we're seeing now is you now have al-Qaeda-related groups 
pushing out some of the so-called moderate opposition. And I will make one prediction here. I mean, uh, the person we can't talk about, him. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, President Trump, uh, I think, said that the army, the American military was going to obliterate ISIS. I do predict that he will claim to have obliterated <laughs> ISIS. But it's no easier than it was six months ago. In some ways, it's more complicated because it requires an engagement that he's mm. very leery of. And luckily, as you say, people like uh, the new national security advisor not only has knowledge of the Middle East, has a kind of nuanced knowledge of the yes, Middle East. So it's does. interesting that he, unlike he Trump, exactly says, which he, which he don't refer to Islamic terrorism. You know, separate those because, because we need this a is strategy. not Islam. This exactly. is not Islam. It, it was a very interesting point. But you know, the, the Kurds are doing a lot of fighting. Uh, so give guns to the Kurds. Hold on a minute. But Turkey, a NATO ally doesn't like this. So the, the position is incredibly complicated, as Mina explained. Well, it is. And also, I mean, it's all wonderful to hear about ISIS or Daesh losing um, battles and, and losing uh, ground. Uh, but A, you'll hear about them using drones. Um, and uh, and making a lot of casualties on the ground and in Mosul in some in some areas, but also, you know, at the same time, you know that they are going to concentrate their intelligence in spreading terror still in Europe. This is you know what they are very good at at doing. And it doesn't take many, as we know in France, it, it doesn't take no, many people to be able no, to cause some, a great deal of damage. And some states in Europe, like Belgium, are extremely uh, vul vulnerable uh, to uh, all the fighters that have dual nationality, for instance, or and. And also, recently there were, you know, the, all those centres, and you have them in the UK, of de-radicalisation. Well, it's, uh, in France, the report said that it didn't work, you know. Um, so I think the war is also in the head, in the minds. Yes, and, we and that's, need, you we can't need... declare victory on that. Exactly. Very the easy. idea that anything could happen quickly is just out of the question. I mean, when you, there's no short term. It, you just take Iraq, you had the Iran-Iraq war. You had the revolution, you had the Iraq, take in Iran, but let's start, take Iraq, Iran-Iraq war, you had the first Gulf War, you had the invasion in 2003, now it's 2017. You know, this is not going to be solved overnight. And the first Iraq war, Gulf War, was 1991. Exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, it's you've a got generation. Two, yeah, and you've got two generations that have been yeah. Yeah. because for young people, I mean, there are 140,000 children inside of Mosul, and in Western Mosul, they are under siege. I mean, the, the idea that mm. no food, no medical substances, nothing is coming in, unless they're given something to look forward to, and they feel that the world actually looked out for them. What kind of impact is going to have on these people? Do you do you see a redrawing though of because of because of the risks from Iran, as seen in Saudi Arabia and mm -hmm. elsewhere? There is a new diplomacy going on, though, isn't there? There is, uh, and it's very yeah. interesting new diplomacy, and actually. Donald Trump has reflected that uh, in, yeah. in, in some ways because the be position is wrong. Yeah, well, very certainly. significantly, it, yeah. the Saudi foreign minister has visited Baghdad. That mm. development is of huge consequence for Arab relations, and intra-Arab relations are very strained. Um, but there have been some developments. So with the new Lebanese government, with the fact that the Lebanese president, who was seen as an ally of Iran, being received in all the Arab capitals, we have the Saudi foreign minister going. There are overtures to try to bring back some of the Arab countries that felt that Iran was a better partner, try to change that. But again, mm. like Sarkis said, this is going to be a long game. Because Iraq, but that was the other Iraq, was a bulwark against Iran, is how it was seen right. in many countries. And over but, a million people died in the Iran-Iraq war in that so-called bulwark. But, mm. you know, Iraqis have always paid the highest price. Mm -hmm. so, and, and as you rightly point out, Benjamin Netanyahu is a player in this game, too. Well, he would like to be a player. And, and I, think he, I, I think he overstates, as does Trump, uh, the likelihood that any Arab coalition or any Saudi government uh, is going to meaningfully uh, invite Israel or the United States into this kind of grand coalition if there is no at least attempt at progress 
to rein in settlements, get some sort of political resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, because that's still a toxic issue in the Arab world. Well, because well, no Arab leader is going to no. abandon the Palestinians no. uh, and do that, no. that publicly, are no. they? But I mean, the, the, that part of American diplomacy has got very interesting in this past week. You know, the, the comments of the National Security Advisor, the sophistication of those comments, I think, was very interesting, wasn't mm. it? Yes, and what you don't know is that the dynamics of, of the executive branch or, of government are just crazy. They're just, you just, you just don't know from day to day who is really running things and how it's being run. And yes, there are some sm there are some smart people. There are some supposedly strong people who have not been uh, politically deeply tied to Trump, like like Tillerson, for example, the Secretary but, of State. The Secretary of State. But the sec this re goes reminds me so much of of back in two thousand and two, two thousand and three. The sec the, the State Department seems to be totally sidelined. Yeah. Well, that's it, I'm afraid, for yeah. an almost Trump-free zone in Dateline London <laughs> yeah. this week. You can comment on the program on Twitter and engage with our guests. We'll be back next week at the same time. Please make a date with Dateline London. Bye-bye.